On February 18, 1994, just a few weeks before the 1994 NCAA tournament, Paramount Pictures released a somewhat legendary movie called Blue Chips. The movie was written by Ron Shelton, who also wrote heavy hitters like White Men Can't Jump, Bull Durham, and Tin Cup. And it was directed by William Friedkin, who in the past had done a quaint little coming-of-age story called The Exorcist. The movie starred People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive for 1992, the flammable and furious Nick Nolte. No offense to my man Nick Nolte, but 1992 must have been a somewhat unsexy time. Nolte plays a once-glorious coach named Pete Bell, who's on the hot seat after a couple of subpar seasons at a fictional school called Western University. This sudden valley has resulted in a sudden spike in pressure to right the ship, and Coach Bell ends up bending some of his own personal beliefs about the sport in order to get back on top. In the Dime Theater, I'm going to attempt to create a hierarchy of basketball movies through something that I've created called the Cinematic Basketball Quality Rating. It'll measure the quality of the basketball on screen, the overall cultural impact of the film, and the quality of the movie. Let's get started. You've got two choices when you're making a sports movie. Option number one, you hire great actors who can add gravity to the non-sports scenes and do some camera trickery to cover it up. We've seen this move many times. Option number two, you cast real players who can give the athletic scene some actual credibility and just hope that their acting is passable enough to keep the movie from outright sucking. Occasionally you can find actors that check both boxes, but they're rare. The basketball scenes in Blue Chips were filmed in an enormous high school gym called Case Arena, which is in Frankfort, Indiana. The place seats just over 5,000 people. And guess what? Your boy went there to see it for himself. Obviously, I got some shots up. Look, I had on a button up and jeans. Everybody chill. In the area of realistic basketball, Blue Chips really excels, and there's a simple explanation for that. There are real college basketball players filling out the basketball scenes in this movie, and it shows. Guys like Bobby Hurley, Albert Chaney, current Purdue coach Matt Painter, Rick Fox and George Lynch, Alan Houston. These players were being coached by actual Division I basketball coaches, guys like George Raveling, Bobby Knight, and Rick Pitino. These were organized games with highly experienced players and coaches, and everyone was told to actually try and win. It is a movie, so the games would be edited to show the desired outcome, but the basketball looks real because it is real. No movie has ever done that. Bobby Knight famously took the game seriously enough that he intentionally sabotaged the last play of the movie. The play call was intended to be a sideline out of bounds. With about 12 seconds left and Western University down by one, the inbounder was supposed to cut to the right low block and displace Shaq to the high post. Shaq was then supposed to get a back screen, spin off of it, and dive hard towards the rim to receive a lob from Penny Hardaway. Huge dunk. Huge applause. Knight, in typical Knight fashion, forced them to do the scene twice, which apparently really enraged an already excitable William Friedkin. So the story goes, Knight told his players to disrupt Shaq's path to catch that game-winning lob. If you want to talk about believable basketball, Bob Knight choosing to be an asshole so that he could prove that he's not a pushover is about as authentic as it gets. Yeah, Coach Knight would not could not have been a bigger jackass that day. And I've told him that to him, you know, like, God dang, were you an ass that day. <laughs> Knight, Friedkin, and Nolte all on the same set is just incredible to think about. The stories that must have come out of that shoot. Nick Nolte is one of the best on-screen basketball coaches that we've ever had. It's well known that he spent a ton of time with Bobby Knight during the 1992 season, and if anyone was going to capably impersonate Bobby Knight on screen, it's Nick Nolte. His speeches were pitch perfect to things that Knight would have done. Another neat detail in this movie is that you can see Pete Newell, who's a legendary coach, sitting next to Nolte on the bench during the games, where he supposedly told Nolte when to get up and go yell at an official, or what to say to this or that player for this or that reason. This all contributed to the realism that comes off in those scenes. This is a nitpick, but in terms of the sounds in a game environment, I'm always amused by the use of Foley sound in this movie, specifically when the players are finishing at the rim. If someone softly lays a basketball into the hoop, you're not going to get a dramatic swish sound. The basketball scenes in Blue Chips were handled brilliantly, and in that sense, the movie is more or less unrivaled. It has yet to be topped. 
Even though Blue Chips fell short of being an all-out cultural phenomenon affecting non-basketball fans and basketball fans alike, within the basketball world, Blue Chips is still an iconic film. You can still buy a Butch McRae or a Neon Boudot jersey. Action Bronson actually made a mixtape called Blue Chips. Most interesting to me, though, is the fact that Blue Chips actually had an enormous causal impact on the NBA. The filming of this movie took place in the summer of 1993, which was after Shaq's rookie season in the NBA. He was already a gigantic marketing superstar by this point, to the point that the poster for the movie actually featured him as the co-lead of the film. Here's some wild what-if territory for you. If Chris Webber hadn't called the timeout during that infamous national championship game between Michigan and North Carolina, he might have been in blue chips, and it's possible that we might have never seen the Shaq Penny era. Webber was the biggest college basketball star at the time of the filming of this movie, having just been a part of the Fab Five, and the filmmakers apparently really wanted him to be involved. Think of all the things that happened because Penny and Shaq became friends on the set of that movie. The Warriors don't trade those picks to the Magic, which then got sent all over the place and turned into multiple high-quality players, one of which was Vince Carter, who's still playing today. We got the series between Chicago and Orlando in 1995 that ultimately caused one of the greatest I am super pissed seasons of all time from MJ in 1996. To that point, Weber and Shaq were apparently in constant communication, and that communication stopped, according to Weber, when Shaq ran with Penny Hardaway in some of those infamous Blue Chips pickup games. Well, you think if Blue Chips didn't come out, that and then Shaq didn't play with Penny, then Shaq would have told Orlando to draft you instead of Penny? Oh, I know it. It's, it's, it's a fact. <laughs> Ron Shelton is considered by many to be the best cinematic sports writer of all time, and his realism and his approach to cultural issues are a big reason why. His characters don't live in cringy, trope-filled, heroic arcs of redemption. They face unceremonious ups and downs, and he really seems to enjoy writing about the role that sports can play in the plight of a desperate person. I do think that an important question about this movie is, would it have been better without the cameos and the star players? The cameos are constant throughout the movie, and the acting is pretty decisively bad. Dick Vitale's big Hollywood moment goes on for way too long and wouldn't be there if he weren't such a big celebrity in the college game. The scenes with the competing coaches are amusing, mainly because of Nolte, but amazingly terrible. Also, why were all of these college coaches trying to have a meeting with Butch McRae after one high school game? They couldn't spread it out at all? My favorite is Larry Bird, who immediately waves and smiles ear to ear when he hears a voice on his property before he even has a moment to realize who it is. Of the players, Matt Norver did fine, Shaq was stiff but charming enough to get by, and Penny Hardaway had the emotional range of a snow shovel. If I left school, would my mom lose her house and job? Tony's acting was so stiff in the dorm room scene that apparently William Freakin literally slapped him in the face to get the performance he wanted. Other than the slapping of the face, all of that is fine. We got through it, but it does stick out. And to the non-sports fan, the charm of the, hey, it's that one guy, isn't there. It's just terrible acting. There are two voices at war in Blue Chips. The first voice is the one contending that college basketball is a virtuous pursuit at its core and that the presence of money has corrupted that. The other voice is the voice of JT Walsh's character, RIP, who's a visible vocal alumnus and a booster for the program. He explicitly addresses the absurdity of Bell's hypocrisy, pointing out that the player is bringing millions of dollars to the school and that he, the coach, benefits directly from that in a variety of ways. We owe them this money. We owe it to them! Scenes between Walsh and Nolte are by far the most well-performed, and those bits of exposition communicate the entire thesis and dilemma of the movie. There's very little subtlety between them, and it's hard to look away from the explosiveness of their chemistry. Really, it's miraculous that anyone is surprised that we're in this situation, as fans and supporters of college basketball. A hugely valuable workforce starts standing up for their value when they see that their employers desperately need them to succeed and are living lavish lifestyles built on double standards. You'd have to be living in some kind of moral utopia for that to continue to happen. If the status quo had remained the same since the dawn of the sport, I could see where Coach Bell is coming from, but it hasn't. The moment that TV and shoe money started to pour into college basketball, the game changed. But the rules didn't. 
We're talking about archaic rules that address a status quo that no longer exists. Also, Pete Bell is disgusted by the money, but he immediately goes to a shoe guy to find players. It paints a fairly accurate portrait of what the sport is like, navigating the most tolerable, unsavory elements to preserve the savory ones, and hoping that you come out with a clear conscience on the other side. This ultimately proved to be too much of a challenge for Coach Bell. This is certainly a watchable movie, but in a vacuum, removing all of the joy of seeing familiar faces and fantasizing about this fictional college basketball universe is it really a quality film? The highest praise that I can muster is good, not great. Highly memorable, but not highly impactful. I love the lore around this movie. You might even say that I'm quasi-obsessed with it. But even I can admit that it's unlikely to crack any American Film Institute lists anytime in the future. It is imperfect, but Blue Chips is among the best basketball movies ever made. I don't think that I would put it on top, but the realism of the play on court, the good not great performances from the cast, and the lasting cultural impact within the basketball world lead me to give it a 7.7 .7 out of 10. And let me know if you agree. Hey folks, I appreciate you watching, and if you like this video, click the like button and be sure to subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter at jkyleman. Say hey!